from Bern, that's our capital in Switzerland. And uh, Adrian, where is he? Oh, yeah, okay, right. So uh, please take the stage. And you're going to enlighten us on your work on this, what just uh, Kenneth alluded to, this batteryless Rolex Cardius P pacemaker. <laughs> Probably more expensive than the Rolex, I think. <laughs> All yours, Adrian. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to my presentation on a batteryless cardiac pacemaker powered by cardiac motion. Now, as you will see in a moment, the, the group is a very interdisciplinary one, and we all also need that. So I myself, I'm an engineer, accompanied by four other engineers, and there are also four medical doctors in the group. We all, we all have no conflicts of interest. So we all know there exist a lot of active medical implants on today's market. And in the field of cardiology, there are the most prominent ones, the pacemaker, the defibrillator, and the loop recorder. And they have all something in common. They are electric devices, and they need some sort of power supply. And in most of the cases, these are internal primary batteries. So, of course, batteries um, have a limited lifetime, and you need to replace the batteries or the whole device. And for pacemaker, it's in a surgical intervention. And imagine, even or especially young person, um, this is quite an unpleasant prospect. So now, if you have a look at this image of the opened pacemaker, you'll see that on the right side, this gray box, that's the battery, and it accounts for more than half of the total volume of the pacemaker. Even more, um, the battery is very dense and makes devices heavy. So, but fortunately, there are alternative power sources, and here's just a small selection of those we know, like um, we, we humans are very good in harvesting power over a pressure drop, drop um, like in this water dam. Or we're also very good in harvesting from sunlight on rooftops, for example. And in this very min miniaturized way, um, we can also harvest power from the wrist motion in this example to charge the battery of wristwatches. <clears throat> Now these energies are all outside of the body and now we want to um, charge medical implants. Now the question is how are we are gonna do that? And that's exactly the, the interest we have in our group. Um, we just recently showed that we were able to harvest power in the blood flow from the high pressure to the low pressure side, so aortic to venous side, using a Tesla turbine. Also, we have um, introduced a new method to harvest energies subcutaneously um, by using photovoltaic cells capturing the sunlight penetrating the skin. But today I really like to talk about or present you a way how to harvest motion from the heartbeat and or in the body. And now we have many limbs, moving limbs, and moving parts. And we can imagine also harvesting energy from the wrist as we already know it. However, we decided to harvest the energy from the heart, and there are several good, several good reasons for that. And my most favorite, of course, is the heart operates 24 hours and seven days a week. It is also a very enduring muscle. Um, it has repetitive contractions, and as we saw in MRI studies, um, accelerations up to five times the gravity are very common. So now to convert these um, heart motions into electrical energy, we need this device, and you see it's originated from an existing um, automatic clockwork um, all it's needed is basically three main components. We need this 
oscillation weight, which once excited, it starts rotating and charging a spring. This mechanical spring now holds the energy. And once the spring is fully charged, um, it unwinds and drives an electrical generator. This electrical generator then produces as output this signal which we um, harvested. So now, this is the experimental setup. On the top right corner, you see the harvesting device, which is now connected to the electronics, which is needed to just capture these previously generated signals, processing the signals, temporarily store it into a small capacity. And then there's also some electronics needed to um, apply the electric stimuli onto the heart again. So you see that in green, that's the um, electrical circuit, which is now in that nice fancy box. Um, we added some features. I wouldn't even say um, to, to call it a pacemaker. It's basically just a pulse generator where we can adjust frequency and the pulse width. And there's also another knob to just um, change between different harvesting devices. Then we have on the left side the epicardial pacemaker lead, um, which is later sutured directly onto the heart and transmits this pacemaker signal to the heart. Now, here is the, the setup in vivo. You see now that the clockwork sutures directly onto the left ventricle. Um, in addition, you see a small adapter ring which just facilitates the, the attachment of the clockwork onto the heart, but would actually not be needed. Um, there are a lot of cables coming or to be seen on this image here. Um, one cable is going back to the electronics, of course, and then cables coming back, back to the heart, uh, which transmits the electrical stimuli. Do I have it? Yes. So this is the epicardial lead here sutured directly into the apex. And on top of the device, um, we have an inertial measurement unit, which is just to track the motion of this device and for later um, comparison. So now on top right, here you see um, there's a label changing from pacing off to on. Um, we start the movie now and you'll see an intrinsic heartbeat of 90 beats per minute and when pacing is on right now we're performing overdrive pacing with 130 beats per minute during this phase we harvested about 52 microwatts in comparison to today's um, pacemakers this is about four five times um, more So in summary, I'd like to say that the heart seems to be a very convenient energy source. It's also a, a continuous energy source. Um, we showed with our device that we were able to convert the motion into electricity. And even more, we have enough um, power um, the, the energy harvester um, provides to us to power a pacemaker. So, I say we're working on a technique with the potential to build batteryless pacemakers. And with that, I'd like to conclude my talk and thank you for your attention. Great, great talk, Adrian. Great talk, really. And very, very innovative and stimulating. Just to spare you the math, it's 100,000 heartbeats a day, 3 million per month, 36 per year. And if you are happy to live along 100 with the new drugs coming as well and pacemakers, it will be up to 3 billion heartbeats. So uh, just uh, there's a lot of energy around that's probably wasted. And now uh, you could uh, transform that into energy and, and do whatever you want with it. It's really a great, great talk. So we have time for some questions. Just right here. Uh, Lynn Peterson with Trends in Medicine. So 
Is anybody commercializing this, or is this still a university uh, experiment? That's still a university experiment. It's okay. a feasibility study. So when I look at it, um, the, the concept of attaching something to the heart, how would you take it off? What kind of damage would you do? It does not look at all feasible to me. Yes. To actually <laughs> attach something to the heart and expect this to last. You know, somebody is going to live 5, 10, 20, 30 years. I totally agree. And thank you for this nice question. Um, of course, the, the, the pig um, or the in vivo uh, experiment was very invasive, and that's basically just to, to um, make things easier. Um, we can see then onto our experiment um, without having complicated um, procedures. But of course, um, later on, we'd like to um, optimize these devices to capture these um, motions in another way so that we are able, for example, to introduce it into the heart um, using an intravascular um, delivery system um, where you not even need to open a thorax, for example. Yeah, let me just address that. What you're saying, I mean, normally a pacemaker is put in through veins. Nothing actually, you don't open up the chest or get on to the outside of the heart. That's what he's showing. But theoretically, the movement should be able to be accessed transvenously through that. You know, I had one question. I thought there was one. I had one question to you. That was um, uh, that my body is also moving 24-7. Can't you put it somewhere else? I mean, isn't there enough movement in the night and the day in my shoulder where the, where the generator is that you could actually store the energy? My Rolex never fits. I, I don't know how you spend your night, but I'm not moving quite fast during so the night. So I can't store. I mean, can't you store the energy that you use during the day? That's what I would think. No, it's, it's actually two less motion we, we um, do during um, the day. That's, that's exactly um, the thing you do when you wear a watch. It's um, sufficient to power that watch. But of course, um, you'd like to have a device which is um, um, relying on an on a endless power device, not um, relying on your moving, moving body. But the concept still is good to, to think about that. There is a question over Yeah, the concept is, is great and fantastic, and, and thank you for thinking all, all along these lines. I, I just wanted to ask something very similar. I'm not talking about the, 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 the average many, how many years it can stand there, but uh, we use the pacemaker because the heart is broken somehow in the first place. Yep. So there is a <laughs> very soon uh, there will need an operation, or perhaps there will be a cardiac arrest. So how does it interfere, for example, a defibrillator? If you want to use it, will it kill the pacemaker if it's so near to it? So to bring something so near to the heart, to the broken engine, what will be handled? How will it, let's say, interfere for some uh, stent implantation later if you put it in, into it? So, so we are supposed to work on it later. That's the very reason why we put uh, the pacemaker, because it's not perfect. So how can all these operations, all these interventions go on with this device? It has to be tested, perhaps. Yes, of course. Or, or there's um, a question of feasibility. <laughs> exactly. It's a feasibility, and we, of course, tested all our devices on healthy pig, I hope, healthy pig hearts. Um, but of course, um, you can also re always refer onto the um, power that's available um, from the heart itself. And if you make quick calculations with cardiac output and the mean pressure, you realize that we have 1.4 watts. Um, the, the heart is, is um, wasting or <laughs> using for um, pumping the blood into our circulation. So when we talk about uh, harvesting 52 watts, then, or microwatts, sorry. <laughs> then referred to the feasibility or to put something there when we have to work to do some service later on. So how it will interfere with defibrillators, um, with stenting, and so on and so on. Um, that's, that's, of course, um, a very good question, first. Um, there are ways to, to um, make services percutaneously, but um, 
of course, we, we are working on a device which is autonomous, so therefore always producing power and always up to date. They will one day miniaturize that and do that percutaneously. Don't you worry, but the concept is great to, to get the power and energy where you implant another device. A quick, quick question. Okay, quick seconds. question. How long does the battery last now? And are people really asking for this? Is there, is there a, a, a need out there that people are expressing for, for a more for this kind of thing? Oh. And I might. And isn't it just another thing to break? <laughs> well, I haven't broken my my wristwatch so far. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a good question, of course. Um, I mean. Or to, to refer to your first question, batteries last about, let's say, 6 to 12, 14 years. Very depends on how you use it, actually. Um, but of course, um, that's, that's a reasonable question every patient has to, to answer. Um, but especially for younger people, um, they will be very interested um, when they don't want to... to uh... That's like absolutely correct, and actually lifespan in batteries in, in ICDs can be, in some patients, just a couple of years. And you don't want to have an ICD, have it just removed, and have another battery in it. You would be happy to have something which is recharged. Take that answer your question. Thank you very much, Adrian.